Podcast. Another night of team coverage, the Chinese invasion. This is what we're talking about. A man can come, mostly they're Chinese men. Then he will pay. They pay 3,500. Then he, he comes with a lady. Beyond chopsticks and fried rice, the after 5 p.m. only menu at the now shut racist Chinese restaurant. That itchy, uncomfortable feeling keeps Kayole on edge as Osama strikes. I'm here. Whatever I'm told to comply, I'm complying. Anxious wait for rape allegations MP as doctors perform DNA tests. The nays have it. Speaker Justin Muturi survives censure motion saved by the tyranny of numbers but MPs admit failures. NTV Tonight with Smriti Vidyati and Mark Masai. A very good evening to you. Now, the racist Chinese restaurant on the junction of Galana and Lenana roads in Nairobi that stirred controversy in the last few days has been closed down. The restaurant has not been operating with required licenses and they'll only reopen after complying with all requirements. Nairobi Governor Dr. Evans Kidero says investigations into illegal activities at the restaurant have begun. We've got a full team coverage on that shutdown and the growing Chinese influence in Kenya with Sheila Sindeo and Andrew Ching. And we'll also have Dennis Okari on this particular story that has brought this to the fore. Dennis Okari has actually spent the day at the restaurant. Dennis? Well, uh, Mark, we've established a couple of things. First, the restaurant has been serving unusual food, but this comes off a menu that is in full Chinese. The food menu in Chinese, the drinks menu also in Chinese, but this is what I found out today. A few hours after it emerged that this Chinese restaurant didn't have a license to operate, today the Kilimani police, Nakada and county officials came calling. But there was no answer. By the time they arrived, the Chinese owners seen in this picture had disappeared after tip off and closed down the restaurant. Now, we also meant to understand that whenever authorities come here to get documents, they're normally told that the Chinese can't speak English or even Swahili, but when their clients come in, they're able to speak. It's something that the police are trying to establish, trying to get to the bottom of this whole uh, saga. Even the workers who came in early in the morning were shocked to find the gate locked before forcing their way in. They don't understand why the county government is shutting down their only source of livelihood. After all, they are often seen making special visits here, one of them told us. So, So, the police and Nakada have left, and what you're being told by the workers is that this room, the 16 of them, the self-contained rooms, they're being used for prostitution. Now, Hilda, what exactly happens here? Okay, uh, maybe okay, uh, a man can come, mostly they're Chinese men. Then he will pay. They pay 3,500. Then he, he comes with a the lady. They use the room for maybe 30 minutes, one hour, then they, they leave. So the person who cleans will find the evidence, you know? Who are these like, women? Where do they come from? The Chinese people. The women are Chinese yes. and the men are Chinese. The men are Chinese. We made our way through the kitchen that serves a variety of the best Chinese cuisine. A clear sign of negligence by those who cook here. We entered the cold room where the restaurant keeps their meat. We found fresh dog legs hanging. The stench in the room was unbearable. Perhaps shocking to Africans whose presence here is a security risk after 5 p.m. But to the clients, a perfect delicacy. 
the whole place appeared abandoned as workers complained of low health standards. Na sometimes ukiingia kwa guest house unapata kama uchafu wenye macho ndani ni kama condoms na maybe na not maybe hakuna gloves za za kuvaa kwa mikono ukishika those condoms. So una inabidi ushike na mkono yako tu bure. Sasa hapo hivyo maybe utumie akili uchukue karatasi uvae kwa mkono ndio ushike hiyo condom ukieka kwa dustbin na kuna hata mwenye tunasaidiana naye maybe anatoka hapa hivi afta ku clean hiyo room na hiyo wet towels chafu chafu anatuma kwa matumbo anaenda anausha matumbo na hiyo mikono tu the Nairobi governor Dr Evan Skidero said the restaurant will remain shut but absolved his government that it was not aware they were operating illegally na zile license ambayo natakana kama unaendesha biashara iwe nayo kama leseni ya kuuza pombe leseni ya afya uh, na uh, leseni uh, ya physical planning ambayo kama utakugeuza nyumba iwe pale unafanyia biashara uh, upatiwe leseni na, na county government na hizi hazikuwa zimepeanwa back at the chinese restaurant and some of the patrons who were hiding from the authorities packed their suitcases and hurriedly left the restaurant as the fate of the workers remains unknown at least for now Dennis Okari, NTV. All right, well, some really shocking discoveries and uh, revelations there. But uh, Sheila, Andrew, and Dennis, it should be noted that the Chongqing Chinese restaurant has, in fact, apologized. Uh, the managing director said that the decision not to allow Africans after 5 p.m. was taken after a 2013 incident where it was robbed with gun-carrying thugs. Uh, Sheila, what should we perhaps make of that uh, apology? It came via statement. Well, the statement says, quote, we sincerely apologize for this. In future, we shall take more advice and modestly accept suggestions from all the customers, unquote. So overall, he sounds very apologetic, I would say. Right, uh, but the English wasn't the strongest in the statement, and it has several grammatical errors. Dennis, you brought this up in your story. Were any of the uh, other Chinese fluent, uh, Chinese staff fluent in either English or Kiswahili? Mark, this will surprise you that uh, there are a lot of Chinese who have been there since 1998. Now, yesterday, when we were trying to do a live coverage from uh, that particular restaurant, we were told that some of them pretend they don't know how to speak English or Swahili, but they really speak fluent Swahili. And when the clients are coming in, they're able to address them properly. But when authorities come in or if anyone comes in to ask any form of questions, then they pretend they can't speak and they stick to the Chinese. All right, well, uh, rather bizarre, I, I should say. But uh, beyond this story now, China does remain the main source of counterfeit products. And a report by Schneider Electronic, uh, Electric Company rather revealed that China is the main source of fake electronics from cables to switches and even sockets. But who is uh, to blame, Andrew? Well, it's really the Kenya Anti-Counterfeit Agency says that the Kenyans are to blame as well because of our love for cheap things, their quality notwithstanding. The man of Asian origin had been apprehended inside a house full of thick printing cartridges. Stuck up high in most of the rooms, Sam even made for his bed, nestling his mattress above the floor. This was a couple of years ago, but even today the country is still having problems with counterfeit products. The Puma number one logo is also wrong. Just today the anti-counterfeit agency was destroying hundreds of pairs of shoes, all bearing major labels, but all not genuine. The Kenyan market is flooded with counterfeit goods from beauty products to food and alcohol and even electronics. So these are the ones that cause a lot of short circuiting. A lot the best way they can tell a product is fake is if the bearer of the trademark and brand didn't authorize the manufacturer to produce it. The anti-counterfeit agency attributes the thriving of the illegal sector mainly to inadequate checks at the ports. For instance, according to the agency, only 1% of goods leaving China are inspected. Yet that is their main source. What is manufactured or made in Kenya forms a very small percentage. Majority of the things come from China. And they come from China either direct or through Dubai. There is also the love for cheap well, things it's or it's big brands that the buyer may not be able to afford. There are very many people who have arrested. And uh, the cry has always been the same. They say that if I have a genuine 
Kenyans will not buy. They come and say, I have 5,000 and I want a Galaxy. Or I have 4,000 and I want a Samsung. And the genuine Samsung will never go for that much. So they're saying that's why we have to give them this. So there is that market. It's difficult to stop people from, I mean, to prevent people from going for cheap things. Kenya has been listed as among the countries that rebrand or repackage counterfeited goods, mostly for re-export to other African countries. The counterfeit business in Kenya is estimated to be worth 30 billion shillings. Yet it is also very dangerous because most of the counterfeit goods are substandard. They cannot they withstand the, the resistance, the, 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 electric, the current. Their resistance is weak. You find them melting. And these ones cause fire. The agency says it is educating Kenyans on the effects of counterfeits, but more also needs to be done by the countries producing them. But it is not a Nokia. You see, when you look, it is an M-Horse. Andrew Ocheng, NTV. But you see, if you sell it, somebody... Well, the Chinese takeover, it appears, is not just in the country's big business, but also in art. Kenyan artists are protesting what they say is the selection of foreigners to represent Kenya at an upcoming exhibition in Italy. Sheila? Well, Mark, it's a curious thing. An online protest is already gathering momentum to petition the government against what the artists say is a fraudulent representation of Kenya at the event, as most of those who've been selected to represent Kenya are mostly Chinese. Every two years, the iconic city of Venice hosts what is described as the Art Olympics. From the 9th of May, this fixture, the biggest cultural event, will be set like a dining table to the world. Kenya will be putting on a display titled Creating Identities. But the country's own identity crisis is at the center of a storm stirred up from what is a curious list of participants at the event. Kenya, it appears, has sold its art scene to China. Majority of Kenya's representatives on the big stage are Chinese. There's only one native artist, Yvonne Apio. Founded in 1895 as an international art exhibition, this year's will be the 56th edition. Two years ago, Kenya also had eight Chinese representing the country in the cultural event. And the local artists are now fuming, protesting what they see as a fraudulent representation at the Venice Biennale. The protest has caught on online with a petition to the government. The arts are the last bastion of expression, and we can't have that also taken away by corruption and neocolonialism, laments one petitioner in the online campaign at change.com. Here's another one on Twitter. Hey, Mr. President, the Chinese are representing Kenya at the Venice Biennale Art Festival. Sports and Culture Cabinet Secretary Hassan Wario, however, said Kenya will not be sending any representatives to this year's event. He attributed this to poor planning and late registration on the organizers' part, asking participants to prepare for 2017. Sheila Sendeo, NTV. Well, a curious one indeed. And uh, Dennis, Sheila, Andrew, all these stories that you've uh, covered all have a lot of public interest and some, or rather, a lot of emotion attached to them, as we saw on social media last night. What is it that people want? Dennis, I'll start with you. Well, Sambriti, people do not question the Chinese when they come into the country to build our roads. As a matter of fact, they love it. But they're questioning the number of uh, those Chinese they're seeing opening up restaurants and some of them who are not in very clear business, uh, businesses. And they're questioning what is the motive of all these Chinese that we're seeing in our country. All right, Sheila. Well, it, it's, it's a very big event, as they've described. It's the Art Olympics. So what the artists really want is someone who's very Kenyan to be in charge of the Kenyan pavilion, the Kenyan showcase at that particular event, because as it is right now, it is, it is a non-Kenyan who is in charge uh, of the Kenyan pavilion in that showcase, although the ministry uh, said they will not be sending any representatives from Kenya at this particular year, but um, they're preparing for showcasing uh, what they're calling or what they're titling as creating identities but it is this sort of an identity crisis so to speak that the artists are complaining about because a lot of the people who are going to be involved in it are not really Kenyans and um, they want a Kenyan involvement uh, artists who really have the understanding of Kenyan issues Kenyan cultures there are very many contemporary artists uh, that are coming up and they, they, they they've been showcasing their works in uh, various parts of the world and they want such people to be involved in such events 
Well, when it comes to counterfeit goods, uh, uh, the main issue is uh, the main the main thing that the agency wants to do is perhaps to teach Kenyans and change the culture shift and make them start uh, buying genuine things, uh, not just genuine things, but local genuine things as well, so that they can support uh, the local industries here. Because even some of the things that are being uh, made, some of the things that some of the products that are counterfeit are local Kenyan brands that have been uh, that have been taken abroad and then they've been reproduced and are now being sold here so that that has been the main thing just trying to change trying to bring a culture shift into Kenya thank you thank you Andrew Sheila and uh, Dennis for this uh, and uh, have the Chinese taken advantage of Kenyans hospitality and become thankless perhaps Ken Mijungu takes a look at some of the instances that suggest the Chinese may not be as grateful as they should be the last time we heard about the tens of Chinese nationals arrested in a city estate was when one senior Chinese government official requested that they be repatriated to their motherland to face charges. That was before today when they made another unsuccessful attempt to be released on bail. Unfortunately, they are not the only ones who have ignited a controversial story touching on the people from East Asia. This was one of a kind story, the arrest as dramatic as their stay in the country, the activity as controversial as their number that kept changing. They were accused of providing unlicensed telecommunication services. How they got here is still a mystery, how they operated and detected a puzzle. And there are many neighbors around this house. One of them should have said, look, there's something going on here. But long before they came, many before them were already caught in controversy in Kenya. The government is yet to explain how the Chinese nationals obtained work permits. It's not uncommon to see Chinese nationals who can hardly speak English driving around town with valid driving licenses. How they obtained them cannot be explained. But they better change quickly. They better change quickly because before they found out. The Asians have also been accused of fueling poaching. A damning report released last year showed that a Chinese delegation of senior government officials visiting Tanzania smuggled ivory using the VVIP plane. In Kenya, there have been similar cases where Chinese nationals have been arrested and ivory found in their possession. This is our country and therefore anybody who lives here with us right, has to adhere to certain minimum standards. The latest controversy is packed with a controversial rule of no admission of Africans at one of the restaurants operated by the Chinese is, however, the icing on the cake. For a country with a population just under 1.5 billion, you will expect to find them everywhere. In fact, it is said that one out of every one million people in the world is Chinese. In Kenya, that number is even greater as Kenya offers a vast market for their goods and more investment opportunities. Ken Mijungu, NTV. Well, Ken Mijungu's story there highlighting the thankless, one could say, the thankless Chinese. All right, uh, Mark, you've got more on uh, the biggest Chinese companies in the country. Looking at their activity in the economy, and uh, we just have uh, a quick look through some of the visible uh, activities they've had here. And we'll start with what is possibly the most um, apparent one, that is in the economy. The approach in many African nations has been somewhat a charm offensive. The China Roads and Bridges Company is involved in many infrastructural projects, the biggest one currently being the Mombasa Nairobi Standard Gauge Railway Project. Now, the Pan African Network Group, PANG, is one of the two licensed broadcasting signal distributors in Kenya. It has headlined recently over digital migration. This is because of the rights it is getting over nearly 90% of television audiences under the digital migration program. However, there have been questions over local ownership within the same company. Also in broadcast, this is uh, uh, a Pan-African, CCTV Africa is a Pan-African broadcast station, part of the Global China Central Television Station. The African Bureau is based in Nairobi and has at least three bulletins and broadcast through the government-owned China Central Television Network and locally through the national broadcaster KBC, most of its staff uh, comprised of Chinese nationals. 
Now, also still in electronics, the electronics company Huawei has a lot of its African operations done from Nairobi. It mostly deals in electronics such as phones and tabs with an aim of spreading its presence in the continent. Well, it's something else that has been attached or associated with them. On many occasions, the illegal trade in ivory has been linked to unscrupulous Chinese businessmen in collaboration with local poachers. The ivory is said to, have, to be a prized commodity for traditional medicine in Asia. This part of our team uh, uh, coverage on the Chinese invasion. Another form of invasion we have here. Indeed, we're moving away from the Chinese invasion, Mark II, a very different type of invasion, but one that's ever so irritating. A new terror is causing Kaiole residents sleepless nights. Christened Osama, the terror has been ravaging households across the area and costing residents thousands of shillings in attempts to eradicate it. NTV's Brenda Wanga reports on the bedbug invasion that has caused some residents to sell off their furniture. Mama Margaret Njoki dreads the coming of the night. For a few months now, she has been forced to move from her modest bed at night to the floor. All this in a bid to literally run away from a problem that has caused her untold agony. She isn't the only one. All across this neighborhood, the sentiments expressed are similar. The bedbugs have taken over houses here with devastating results. The severity of this big problem caused by such a small insect is best illustrated by what you see behind me. Residents, after unsuccessfully trying to read the houses of bedbugs, have resorted to disposing of their furniture. The resilience of this little bug has seen residents devise methods of dealing with it. Okay. From candles that have to stay lit to draw and burn them to just about all types of pesticides. But nothing seems to face the bugs. And now the financial strain of eradicating it is beginning to tell. <laughs> It is feared that the bugs are spreading through the larger Kayole area through public service vehicles, cloth hanged on drying lines and people moving houses. The residents now want the public health officer for the county to come to their aid. All they want, they say, is a good night's sleep once again. Brenda Wanga, NTV. Well, bed bugs aren't the only pests that people have to deal with. Here's just a quick look at some of the most common household pests, and they are uh, cockroaches, fleas, lice, termites, and mice. Of course, uh, there are so many more irritants, such as ants, moths, uh, spiders, which I'm personally very afraid of, flies, and uh, what have you. But this is something just to practically illustrate. She can't even look at the screen um, of what we have in, in, in terms of the graphic, the cockroaches, the fleas, the and mice, mice. The mice, the mice, I can't do the mice. She, she can't even look at it. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, not a funny, uh, it's not a funny incident if it, if it invades your home. This is definitely something that um, many would tell you. Uh, you even pray about it. Yeah, and let's just hope that uh, those residents of Kayola get uh, some sort of um, some sort of reprieve from those bed bugs. All right, you are watching NTV tonight. On that note, let's take a break. Governors are supposed to link the producers with the markets. They have to handle the marketing. The maze maze and why Rift Valley farmers are so angry. Cross-country team off to China with an eye on gold. <laughs> Look at it. Okay. It's just a picture. No, I was freaking out. On TV tonight with Smriti Vidyarthi and Mark Masai. It's 29 minutes past the hour. Thank you for staying with us. Imenti Central Member of Parliament Gideon Mwiti may remain in police custody until investigations into allegations of rape against him 
are complete. Muti has been moving around in a police vehicle under the close watch of police officers, indicating that he may not be a free man after all. His DNA samples were taken today to the government chemist for comparison with those taken from the woman accusing the MP of raping her. Meanwhile, the doctor accused of forcefully testing the woman for HIV has denied the allegations. At the government chemist, Imenti Central Member of Parliament Gideon Mwiti spent hours here. The rather shaky Mwiti spent much of his time in a police vehicle, which he has been moving around in since yesterday after he was questioned by detectives at Gigiri Police Station. Two plain cloth police officers stood guard. His aide too hung around, though in the same outfits they were in yesterday at Gigiri. It's reported that Mwiti may have spent the night in police custody. You want them to talk to me? Yes. Yes, Mushima. Yes. The issue is under investigation. I'm complying to what I'm being asked by the police to do. So the best person place to say what it is are the people concerned. So no samples? Well, you know this is a place for samples. So I'm here. Whatever I'm told to comply, I'm complying. He then entered the same vehicle, sandwiched between two officers, and the vehicle left. All pointing to a man under arrest. Mwangi Mushiri, the doctor who allegedly took blood from the said woman for a forced HIV test, has admitted that he was with Muiti and the woman on the same night, but never did any tests. I would not do a test, whether as a favor to a friend, to an aide, even to a couple that would walk in here before you do HIV test. One has to undergo counseling. Counseling does not go on in a pub. He has already recorded his statement with police and appeared before the medical practitioners and dentists board over the same. The woman is still receiving treatment as police hasten investigations. Ashley Mungina, NTV. You're watching NTV tonight. We're about to take a breather, but first let's just get a hint of what to expect in the business news. Dan Mwangi bringing us back the big number. Yes, the big number comes. And I'll explain what it is later on. But first, we'll be seeing again a maze maze. Something not too amazing on business. NTV Business News in association with EMS. Good evening and welcome to NTV Business. I'm Dan Wangi. Now we begin by letting you know the big number for today. Now this is the number that is part of the figures in one of our stories tonight, which we will get to break down a bit further and expound on and get a clearer context of. Now today, the big number is 1,544,918, which is on the screen here. And this could be in whichever unit. It could be shillings, miles, kilograms, name it. We shall reveal this as we go along. And now speaking of numbers, it is a financial results release season. Now Family Bank made an after-tax profit of 1.8 billion shillings for the year 2014, a 45% leap in profitability from the 1.2 billion it attained in 2013. That's on the banking side. Now, on Insurance Matters Jubilee Holdings Limited saw its turnover for gross return premiums in 2014 surpassed the 30 billion shilling mark for the first time ever. Alex Mongi with more. Family Bank's net interest income surged by 20% to 5.4 billion shillings with customer deposits growing by 36% to 47.2 billion shillings during the 12-month period. We are going to be investing close to 1 billion shillings this year in upgrading our IT infrastructure. Uh, I think the, the hiccups that we had is actually a result of actually our success, and we are addressing this and addressing it very quickly. The bank's loan portfolio appreciated by 36% to 37.9 billion shillings. The total assets in the balance sheets have moved from 43.5 billion shillings to 61.8 billion shillings, which is quite a very tremendous growth. The bank has 82 branches and 1.6 million customers and is on course to attain Tier 1 status by next year. So I'm very happy to announce that this year the board is recommending a dividend of 50 cents per share which is, this is the highest dividend in the history of this bank. Still on financial matters, Jubilee Holdings Limited posted a 24% growth in after-tax profit to 3.1 billion shillings in 2014. Gross return premiums for the 12-month period were valued at 30.4 billion shillings, 
up from 23.4 billion shillings in 2013. We are definitely looking at companies that we want to acquire, not only in this market, but also in uh, the region. The value of the farm's assets went up by 22% to 74 billion shillings during the year. Earnings per share rose to 48 shillings as of December 2014, compared to 38 shillings the previous year. Despite the growth, the insurance company continues to face a number of challenges, including... Medical is a problematic one, not only for us, but for the whole industry. And uh, we can tell you that from our side, 40% of all the claims that we are receiving have some element of fraud. The regulator has gone a step ahead and created a unit where we have the anti-fraud police unit. These are the ones we use. The Jubilee Group has declared a final dividend of 7 shillings and 50 cents per share and a 1 for 10 bonus share issue to be executed in the current financial year. Alex Mwangi, NTV Business. Now this is a point where we have some drum rolls because we are about to reveal the big number. 1,554,918 is a big number today because of how small it is. Well, at least according to farmers. Now these are the number of 90 kilogram bags of maize that the NCPB uh, bought from the farmers. Now the NCPB, that's the National Cereals and Produce Board, has purchased 1.55 million bags from farmers, yet the cereal growers harvested 40.3 million bags. Now, quick math is that this is just about 3.9% of their produce yet. They were hoping the board would buy all of it. However, this is the most maize the government has bought in the past five years from the farmers. Now then again, whose job is it to buy maize from farmers, the national government or the county governments? Members of the Parliamentary Committee on Agriculture have accused the government of failing to allocate adequate resources from the purchase of maize from farmers, a situation that left farmers exposed to middlemen. Devolution is one aspect of the government that has been handled with perhaps the most confusion, with county governments not being clear on exactly what has been devolved and what hasn't. This separation of roles is the monster that haunts the agriculture ministry, especially on matters maize purchase. The ministry has found itself under a rain of stones brought down by farmers who are demanding to know why the national government doesn't seem interested in buying all the maize harvested last year. In its defense, the ministry says maize patches is ideally a county function. If you look at Schedule 4, and if you look at the Gazette notice that was done in August 2013, it is very clear that governors are supposed to, governors are supposed to link the producers with the markets. They have to handle the marketing. The same concerns were brought up at a parliamentary committee hearing, with members saying it is unfair to devolve maize patches to the counties. Some of us have met our governors, and they've told us here, there is no allocation for buying this. The owners to ensure that there is sufficient food and that the farmers continue producing maize lies square and stops with the Minister for Agriculture. The money is that the governors had to use for any activity in the counties is included in the percentage that is always sent there. There is no specific breakdown from national government to them. It is for them to break down and get to know how much money will go in it, so where. So far, the counties have not yet put in place structures to absorb the maize harvest, forcing the national government to continue purchasing through the National Cereals and Produce Board. Since the purchasing started in November last year, NCPB has bought 1.5 million bags of maize, valued at 4.3 billion shillings. This 1.5 million is just a fraction of the season's harvest, and last week farmers in Eldred complained that NCPB wasn't buying any more maize because it had run out of money. Treasury will be releasing a further 500 million shillings to mop up more maize, bringing the total number of maize bought in this season to at least 2 million. This is the highest quantity that the government has purchased in the last five years. Zainab Wandati, NTV. Now, the board of the Kenya Airport Authority has reinstated the farm's managing director, Lucy Mbogua, and three senior managers. The four had been sent on a 30-day compulsory leave starting February 19th, pending investigations to a controversial duty-free shop tender. The board says that the findings from the preliminary investigations informed this decision. And now, let's take a look at financials. NTV Financial Report, in association with Total. 
All right, the 24th day of March 2015 and the NAC 20 share index is at 52.54.60 coming slightly down from yesterday. Market capitalization is at 2.409 trillion, a slight rise from yesterday. And bonds are still with below a billion at 642 million from 283 million worth of the same traded yesterday. The most active stock is Safaricom, 6.65 million shares having been traded. Equity Bank is third at 3.51 million, just 0.02 million below KPLC. And we have CS Insurance coming forth at 3. 24 million shares being traded today. Now the biggest gainer today is Tanchat, whose value rose 4.5 percent to close at 346 shillings per share. Total Kenya up 3.92 percent. CS Insurance at 9.55 per share is up 3.24 percent, and Uchumi Spa Markets at 10.95 per share is up 2.82 percent. Now. East, everybody, East Africa is the biggest decliner with a drop of 6.33% in the price per share, which today closed at 370. Kennel Cobill down 4.1%. Samia Africa at 6 shillings and 20 cents per share is down 3.13%. And Olympia Capital at 5 shillings and 80 cents is down 2.5%. The Forex numbers, the US dollars at 91.97, a slight gain on the side of the shilling. The sterling pound 137.41. And the euro from 99.55 yesterday today crosses the 100 shilling mark at 153 today. Now the forex number on, on the African end is South African rand 771, Tanzanian shilling 2004, Ugandan shilling come from 3195, goes up 3224 and Rondis franc is unchanged at 749, same case as was yesterday and the day before. That's financials for today. NTV Financial Report in association with Total. This is the point where we are all done. Business and myself, have yourself a good night. Back to Mark and Sweetie. Dan, thanks very much. More from you tomorrow. Yes. And more from us after this short break. Stay with us. Welcome back to NTV Tonight. President Uhuru Kenyatta is putting pressure on all envoys, envoys rather, to perform and repair what he terms as the unfair, unnecessary and damaging profiling of the country abroad as insecure. Speaking in Kuala, the president said that although efforts are being made to have travel advisories lifted, diplomats must work hard to market Kenya as an investment and tourism destination. Well, Peter Mwangangi reports now from Kuala. It was the first ever such gathering since the Jubilee administration assumed office, a meeting that brought together all ambassadors and high commissioners serving in Kenya's 54 missions spread across the world, a seven-day session that seeks to build bridges for effective diplomacy abroad. The president making it clear that all envoys must have a sound grasp of Kenya's interests in their respective postings. One urgent task ahead of all of you is to mitigate the unfair, unnecessary, and damaging profiling inflicted on our country, especially as regards the security situation. The conference comes at a time when the country's foreign policy has undergone periods of uncertainty. The relationship between Kenya and the West became frosty after the head of state and his deputy assumed office in 2013. At the time, both had cases pending at the International Criminal Court. With that, Kenya appeared to turn east, strengthening the relationship with China to its benefit. So that's why... But now the West appears to have softened its stance, especially after charges against the president were dropped. We've had a challenge where travel advisories have been imposed not only on Kenya but the coast region and we've suffered. Sio kuona wazungu peke yao ndiyo tourists that wa Afrika akifika pale kumfungulii visa unamwambia arudi kwao apate apatiwe hapo airport ya kuja hapa kwale alawache pesa yake hapa if our diplomatic engagement is now premised on the positioning and maintaining of Kenya as a choice destination for trade trade in goods and services later the president launched the Balozi Connect app a mobile platform which will make possible real time conversations between the heads of mission in different countries and state house. This whole week, heads of different government agencies will engage the diplomats and give them crucial information concerning their departments. The Jubilee administration hopes that this will translate into better results for the remaining part of its tenure in office. Peter Mongangi, NTV, Kwale County.
A motion to censure National Assembly Speaker Justin Muturi was defeated on the floor of the House as members turned the session into a platform to discuss issues of integrity facing the House. Well, during the debate, members of the National Assembly admitted that indeed the dignity of Parliament had been lowered by allegations of corruption and sex scams currently directed at some members of Parliament. Publicly, members of this house are accusing each other of stealing money from the public. This house has reached a stage where members of this house, we have reached a level of disrepute that this weekend when I was holding a church function, a person who opposes me locally said, what are you saying and all of you are actually thieves and all you do is keep opening your zips. There are members who have been accused of very bad manners and very bad behaviors, Madam Speaker, on many trips, including the latest one in Japan, Madam Speaker. Corruption has been mentioned in every committee of this parliament, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this house is turning to Sodom and Gomorrah, Madam Speaker. The Speaker cannot just listen and just wish away things. He has to bring it to our attention. And that is the reason why the Jeboi's committee is leading an investigation. And in fact, the members there have accused one another. Oh, I saw you receiving money in the dark. You know such kind of things, Madam Speaker. You know, <laughs> these are all said by members here. Then how do you allege that the Speaker has said something that is unfounded? And you, you have even invited, like take for instance the Agriculture Committee the other day. They fought until they invited the press into the committee. And the press was not in the committee itself. Madam Speaker, it is not right to say that since one person is wrong, the other person is justified to be wrong. But I'm speaking two wrongs do not make a right. Until we reach a point where we can acknowledge that indeed there is a crisis in this house, that indeed as honorable members, we bear the responsibility to look at these issues and decide to make a difference, then we'll not make a difference. We'll continue to engage in blame game after blame game. On the floor of the studio to pass the motion of sports, I believe. And that's right, Watson's with us. And Watson, what have you got lined up for us? Football, cross country, golf? Yes, indeed. And we have Seth Lala trying to uh, try find the finer details as regards to what has been going on between FKF and KPL. And of course, now the FIFA officials who are in the country to line things up. We have that and plenty more coming on NTV Sport. That's right, time for sports now, and it is catch-up time for the Kenyan Premier League. Having lost over four match days in the 2015 season, KPL has lined up six matches tomorrow across the country. This comes after FIFA resolved the four-month stalemate that saw the formation of two leagues. With the world governing body insisting that there are no winners or losers in the new deal, Sethalale reads us the final print. It's football. There must be a winner and a loser. <laughs> From the body language, one could judge who the winner was after FIFA officials announced a solution to an ongoing tussle between FKF and KPL. The interest of Kenya was paramount. Uh, they sacrificed their personal and group interests in favor of Kenyan football. Pandits say that KPL gained in the short term with FKF winning in the long run. KPL's biggest gain was to run the 2015 top tier league, featuring 16 teams, remain on its broadcast deal with Supersport over the same period, and FKF to withdraw the court case. What FIFA wanted is that we had a promotion and relegation, and we have agreed that there would be promotion from the KPL League, Premier League. And the Premier League was running without... Uh the blessings of the Federation. So at least for the next uh, few months, this season at least, players will play with, uh, with ease of mind. FKF will have to wait until next year when a league comprising 18 teams will be adopted as from 2016 and that the Federation shall reserve all commercial rights for the top flight league from 2016 onwards as part its statutes. However, its sponsorship deal with other media now lies in limbo. KPL will go on with their super sport and FKF will go on with their Assam. At the end of the year now, we will sit down and see how we can harmonize. 
it, it's going to be difficult for Azam because if they have they signed a contract on the basis that they will support the FKF Premier League, which they already they've, they've already started supporting, eh? it will be very difficult for Azam now to come back and uh, and and sign another contract now for the Kenya Premier League which is already under super sport. Ultimately, the outcome from the initial meetings of football win, but the modalities of the transition and next season's league could force a replay of current events. The two parties are expected to send a memorandum of understanding which will define the structures such as the promotion and relegation of the teams. It is also understood that FIFA directed FKF to hold its election before the end of this year. The FIFA delegation, which also includes regional FIFA development officer Ashford Mamelodi, will spearhead the MOU in the coming weeks, said Olale and TV Sport. Go forth and conquer the world. That is the message the national cross-country team has taken to foray at the World Championships in China. The team will on Saturday attempt to beat the world, seeking to emulate their predecessors who have treaded the cross-country scene in years gone by. The national cross-country team departed for Guyan, China early this evening to fly Kenya's flag at the 41st edition of the World Cross-Country Championships. <laughs> Despite the absence of defending senior main champion Jafet Korir, Kenya has high hopes of defending the team title. In the hunt will be World Half Marathon champion Geoffrey Kamoror, three times national cross-country champion Bedan Karoki, African cross-country champion Leonard Barsoton, African junior cross-country champion Moses Mukono, Philip Langat and Joseph Kitum. <laughs> For the senior women team, eyes will be on defending champion Emily Chebet, 2013 World Cross Junior Silver Medalist Agnes Jebet, Janet Kisa, Irene Chebet, Alice Aprot and Stacey Ndiwa. Missing the action is 2013 World Cross Junior Champion Faith Chepengetich, who got a toe injury in training. <laughs> Athletes, I want to stay here. Nata okiwa wana ame fry ata akilisau kicharupu kwa fatilia iko China. In the junior men, Team Kenya won silver last time out, but now has to battle Ugandan rising star Joshua Cheptegei, who is a 10,000 meters world junior as well as African junior champion. Kenya is a defending champion in junior women's event and hope lies in world youth steeplechase champion Ross Flynn chopping a teach. Speaking at the send of dinner, Athletics Kenya top brass were confident of Kenya's prospects. When we go to China, we're young, I think we are going to bring all the medals that are available. The World Championships will be held on Saturday morning. Warote Kiru, NTV. Now, KCB women's volleyball team departed the country this afternoon for the African Women's Club Volleyball Championships, which will kick off in Egypt on Thursday. The team, coached by Vernon Kainga and captained by Gladys Wairimo, has been training in Nairobi and are optimistic of returning home with the continental crown they last won in 2006 in Mauritius. KCB qualified for the continental extravaganza after clinching third place in the national playoffs held in Mombasa last year. Other Kenyan representatives in, the, in Cairo are Giants, Kenya Pipeline and Kenya Prison. Top amateur John Karichu shot three and a par to lead professional Greg Snow by one shot as the 2015 JTL tournament got underway at the par 71 Muthaiga golf course. Mumia's golf clubs, Dismas Indiza, who fired one under par 70 was that. Meanwhile, the 2015 Kenya Open received a boost with Coca-Cola sponsoring the 17th, I mean the 7th April tournament to a tune of 14 million shillings. John Karichu, Nelson Simua, Robinson Owiti, Alfred Nandua, Boniface Kasgay, Alfred Nandua and Matthew Wahome are some of the 22 Kenyan players set to take part in the Kenya Open out of the 156 scheduled to play. It is actually in seven attempts back home. Now, this guy must probably have been watching NTV Sport because Kenyan football fan Paul Wainaina is the winner of Sport Pesas Weekly Jackpot worth 8.9 million shillings. The 31-year-old father of two becomes the second person to win the jackpot after Andrew Mganga won 5.3 million shillings last July. The jackpot requires that a fan predicts the outcome of each match in a series of 13 jackpot games. Wainaina 
who is an ardent Chelsea and Thika United fan, won by simply placing a bet of 100 shillings and got all the 13 predictions correct. And that is a nice place to wind up NTV Sport, guys. Lucky Y9 of there. He's <laughs> sleeping happy. <laughs> Yes. All right, Watson, thanks very much indeed. More from you tomorrow. That's where we wind up NTV tonight. Pleasure to have you with us. I'm Smriti Vidyarthi Mohendra. I'm Mark Masa. On behalf of the team, thank you for watching. I'm Watson Karuma. Have a good night.